Welcome. Welcome to Australian China Institute for Arts and Culture at Western Sydney University. My name is Jing Han. I'm the director of the Institute. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands we are sitting on today, and in particular, the Darug people of the Darug Nation, where the Institute is located on Parramatta South Campus, and I pay our respect to the First Nations elders, past, present, and emerging. Welcome back to our Chinese Australian History Seminar series. We are very pleased that many people enjoyed the series. Today, we're going to have Professor Michael Williams to talk about merchants and the Qing Dynasty, 1881 to 1911. It's going to be a very interesting and informative session. I've been looking forward to it. While Michael is talking, you can post your questions at Q&A section uh, at the bottom of the screen, and I will collect them for Michael to respond when he finishes the lecture. Now, please welcome Professor Michael Williams. Uh, thank you, Jin, uh, and welcome everybody to this uh, our third in our series of lectures. And uh, for those you attended previously, you might remember the previous lecture was about uh, uh, primarily about the gold rush period. And for many people, it's the gold rush period that's the foundation uh, of Chinese Australian history. But in many other ways, it's this period that I'm going to talk about today, which is to say uh, the late, uh, <clears throat> late uh, 19th century, early 20th century. That's really, in many ways, the foundation uh, of Chinese Australian history. And the reason I say that is that it's this period that lays the network for many of the people who are now uh, the descendants of, of, uh, of these early Chinese Australians. And also it allows, uh, uh, it, it, it involves Chinese Australians in a far greater range of activities and, and occupations than simply uh, gold mining. Uh, and uh, so in many ways, this as I would argue is the, um, it's the gold rush is the kind of psychological foundation of Chinese Australia. It's this period that I've titled Merchants to the Qing that is in many ways the kind of real uh, foundation. So in this period, of course, uh, from 1881 to 1911, uh, there are many things happening, and of course, I won't have time to uh, to deal with all of them. So I'm going to focus on th four uh, main themes as we move through uh, uh, an overview of this history. Uh, it's the period, for example, uh, when white Australians particularly begin to uh, define Australia in ways that increasingly limit uh, the presence and participation of people from China. But it's also the period when Chinese merchants themselves build up quite strong uh, domestic, both domestic and international trading and business networks. And this is very important uh, to the subsequent histories. Uh, it's also a period when Chinese workers themselves are increasingly resented by European workers. It's a period when trade union movement in Australia and then later the Labour Party becomes quite strong. And this is, this is uh, combined with a kind of a racism and a kind of a, a workers racism that sees them reject um, uh, workers who are not uh, considered to be within their, within their field. Uh, and then finally, it's the a period of uh, where politics of reform and even of revolution become very important as uh, during the decline of the Qing and ultimately uh, the period that I've, uh, the date that I fixed as the end of our period, 1911, sees the end of the Qing Empire and the founding or the beginning of the founding of the first uh, Chinese Republic. And this in includes a uh, sense, an increasing sense of uh, what we could call Chineseness, and we'll talk about a little bit more about what that means uh, later in the lecture. So, for, uh, overall, I'd summarise this period as being one that is both the peak of a uh, Chinese Australian influence in this early period, and also the beginning of a decline, because of course it is the beginning uh, of the founding of the Australian, uh, Australian uh, White Australia policy uh, in 1901 with the Federation uh, of the Australian Colonies. So just to, to look at the, the beginning of the period, the 19, uh, 1881, we begin then uh, with a renewal of restrictions against Chinese immigration. If you remember from the previous period, uh, restrictions during the gold rush period had been rescinded. And for a period uh, in the 80, late 1860s through the 1870s, there had been no restriction on Chinese people or any other people coming to or from the Australian colonies. Uh, but this changed in 1881. Uh, and it changed for a variety of reasons to do with various labour disputes, uh, with a renewal of uh, increased numbers of Chinese people coming for tin mining and for a range of other uh, 
business and uh, other occupations. And so in 1881, New South Wales began to impose restrictions again. This time another 10 pound poll tax, the same amount as previously, but a new restriction was on naturalization. Uh, that's to say Chinese people could no longer apply to become naturalized within the colony of New South Wales and later Victoria and other colonies as well. And this was a new restriction uh, um, that was quite uh, over and above what had been previously imposed. And these restrictions were ramped up very greatly in, in 1881. Uh, 1888. In 1888, the Australian colonies met and began to discuss uh, seriously federation. Uh, and they also discussed the uniformity of um, anti-Chinese restrictions. And this is what they agreed to in 1888. Didn't quite achieve uniformity, but they did. But in theory, all the colonies did have some form of restriction and New South Wales in particular, and also Victoria ramped up their poll taxes to a much more excessive 100 pounds. And this began to have quite a significant impact on numbers of people coming into uh, these colonies. And so we have to ask ourselves, of course, uh, uh, as we begin to look at these restrictions that were specifically tailored towards Chinese people, is were Chinese people uh, a cause or were they merely uh, the a result of some other influences here? And this is something that we need to look at carefully uh, over, this, over this period. Uh, and so before we do that, we need to look at the overall context within which this is happening. And of course, uh, very much this is the context of colonialism, and in particular of the of the British Empire, of which Australia were, or the Australian colonies were an integral part. And so, this within this empire at this period of time, the idea was that there would be free uh, immigration, and this was, of course, primarily for the benefit of the colonial rulers. Uh, of course, they saw free immigration as free immigration of cheap labour. And so, within that empire, uh, Indian and Chinese people, for example, uh, travelled down to the, to the British Strait Settlements, what later became Malaysia and Singapore. Indians also went to Fiji and to what later became South Africa. Uh, and within Australia itself, uh, many workers from many country parts of the world came to do various kinds of work. Southeast Islanders and Japanese to work on the sugar plantations in Queensland, for example. Uh, Af So-called Afghans, really uh, Indian subjects, Indian British subjects, uh, worked as camel drivers and other, other work within Central Australia. And with the growing pearl shell industry in the northern Australia, many people came from Japan, uh, the Philippines, and other parts of Southeast Asia to work as divers in, in, in other associated uh, business. So, for the convenience of people within uh, Australia or in the Australian colonies, uh, the free migration of, work, of workers was considered important because they considered that to be the free migration of cheap labour or labour that they could get to do particular jobs, particularly harsh. Uh, work that they didn't consider white workers were willing or able to do. Uh, and so, of course, this meant within this context, uh, if you're interested in labour politics or, or increasing uh, rights for uh, and particularly wages for labouring people, you could go, you had two choices. You could go multicultural, which is to say, you could say all workers are equal and everybody should be treated equally and all wages should be increased. But this was a fairly hard ask in, uh, in this period. I mean, some people had that idea, uh, but it wasn't an idea and that took on uh, very readily. Uh, so the alternative, uh, in the Australian context at least, was to go white, which is to say that white workers are the ones to be protected and who should be equal among themselves and have their wages increased and other workers did not uh, merit the same um, consideration. So that's one context within which all this period uh, operates. The other context is the broader one also of the so-called overseas Chinese, or Hua Chao which isn't a term that, that is really used at this period, but it becomes very common later in the, in the 20th century. But uh, for our purposes, it's, it's, it's important to know that Chinese people, particularly from Southern China, had been going overseas, uh, dealing uh, in various ways uh, by sending out workers, by sending money back, by sending their bones back, by uh, organizing themselves along dialect and local groups. All these kinds of things that are happening in Australia had been happening um, in Southeast Asia and even in other parts of China since at least the Ming Dynasty, let's say at least the 16th century. And so this is a context within which Chinese people are operating, uh, this kind of wide view uh, of, of movement and travel and connections. Uh, and so much that happens in Australia isn't unique to Australia, and this is an important consideration. And just to give an example of how this is operating, this is a, a list of figures from one, one village, one modest sized village in Southern China at the end of our period, in the, in the first decade of the, of the 20th century. 
And it just shows you the spread of people uh, around, around the world. There's some are in San Francisco, some in Hawaii, and many are scattered all around Australia. So this is a village, of course, that was focused mostly on Australia. Other villages uh, focus on other parts of the world, Cuba, uh, Peru, uh, Malaysia, and so forth. Uh, so you can see quite large numbers in Sydney, but also in places such as Atherton uh, and Cairns. Uh, and so at any one time, this village had something like 40 to 50% of its working age men uh, overseas, uh, overseas working out for various periods of time, sending money back and then visiting uh, on occasion. So this is the overall context within which many uh, Chinese Australians were operating in uh, this period. But within Australia, uh, what's beginning to operate, of course, is what you could consider to be the politics of federation, as federation needs, and also the politics of whiteness. And, and what this means is that Australians, as say Australians, particular British or Irish heritage, are beginning to, to identify themselves in particular ways. And white was convenient for them because they were very divided. Uh, many people consider themselves to be British and Christians. Um, but on the other hand, many did not like the label British. And uh, when they consider themselves to be Catholics, other uh, Christians of certain types didn't consider that to be quite the right kind of Christianity. So there was this, these very strong divisions on both racial, cultural, and of course, uh, religious uh, terms. Uh, again, uh, Australia was beginning to consider itself a workers' paradise, which meant that the workers considered that they were better off in Australia than they had been back in England or in Ireland and these places. They wanted things to, to continue that way. Uh, and so they began to organise and trade union movement is very powerful at this time, as is, of course, the, um, the growth of the Labour Party. Uh, and the Labour Party, uh, by the end of the, uh, the century, by about 1901, is beginning to consider uh, a very straightforward uh, platform of the white Australia policy, that there should in fact be no migration into Australia of natives of Africa, Asia, and the Pacific Islands. Uh, that's the, the, the platform which the Labour Party is willing to, to argue uh, at this stage, and, uh, and that migration to Australia should be white only. But the Labour Party and the working class is of course by no means the, the only ones um, uh, to argue this way. And it's significant to, uh, to remember this period, just how strong the trade union movement has become or is becoming uh, and is able to in fact, uh, support uh, the first trade union based uh, governments uh, in the world uh, at this time. So a very, in many ways, a revolutionary term time for Australia uh, as well. But of course, they were afraid of more things than just um, uh, equal wages or cheap wages uh, for workers. Uh, they also feared uh, many things on, on what we would consider very racist and uh, cultural terms. And so this is a typical uh, bulletin cartoon of the time. Uh, and of course, we can look at this and think, well, is this a fear? This is their fear of kind of cultural mixing. Uh, but for a modern multicultural Australia, this is more like a prediction of what, uh, what Australia has become, uh, perhaps not in the same dress sense, but at least in the sense of, of, an, of a more casual mixing of people of different heritages uh, without, of course, uh, uh, the fear that the bulletin was trying to, to, to illustrate. But I want to emphasize that not everything is happening just on a purely domestic front. So it's not just about Chinese people in Australia. Australia, uh, uh, then as it, as it is today, very much was aware of China as a nation, or the Qing Empire anyway, as a, as a, a large entity uh, looming to the north. Uh, and this is illustrated in this case uh, by a letter that was sent to Henry Parks. So in 1888, there is the Intercolonial Conference, which was a move towards federation. Uh, and in which, uh, as I said before, the anti-Chinese legislation was agreed upon among the colonies. Now, Henry Parks was one of the uh, leaders of this conference and one of the great advocates of, uh, of Australian Federation. And he was sent a letter a couple of years later by General Edwards uh, at Hong Kong, so part of the British Empire. He's writing to a fellow colonial uh, part of the empire. And what he says to him, Henry Parks, is a portion of the Chinese Imperial Squadron is now at anchor under my windows. He's sitting in, uh, in Hong Kong, in what is now the Tea Museum of Hong Kong, if you, you know where that is, about the skyscrapers, he could see all of Hong Kong Harbour. And what he saw was two magnificent ironclads of the newest type, and four very fine and heavily armed cruisers, Admiral Ting in command. And I have been urging him strongly to take his fleet and show his flag in foreign ports, especially Australia. But he cannot go further this year than Singapore 
hands off. Would this not help your federation? Now it's not entirely clear whether whether uh, General Edwards is, is having a bit of a leg pull of Henry Parks or whether in fact he's quite serious. But uh, either way, the context is clear that he thinks that the mere presence of a Chinese imperial squadron would terrorise the Australian colonies into federation very much quicker and make Henry Parks' job uh, easier. So that's the kind of international context with which the Australian colonies uh, is operating. This is very clear that they're very aware of the numbers of people uh, in China and in India as well and feared for their uh, their uh, existence uh, in, in a way that wasn't just about people living in, in uh, Sydney or Melbourne. Uh, but this came out nevertheless on a domestic side in very much in this kind of stereotyping. And this cartoon, another bulletin cartoon, is a very famous one and is often reproduced uh, even today to show uh, any, any fear that people have of a, a particular force. In this case, the force was uh, chinese or people, Chinese people. And you can see from this kind of uh, stereotyping, the kind of negativity, the you know, contrariness of it, the self-serving basis upon which this kinds of fears uh, existed. And I point this out uh, to show uh, not just what people thought, the cartoon itself, for example, was um, drawn by an English cartoonist who only just recently arrived in Australia. And so it was just simply being told this stuff uh, by the editors of the bulletin and, and drew this up, uh, presumably on the, on the basis of what, uh, uh, what they were, were telling him. Uh, but it, the significant thing about this cartoon or this thinking uh, that goes into this is the how successful it was, not just in making people think Chinese people uh, negatively about Chinese people, but also kind of whitewashing that's influenced even our thinking today. Uh, by which I mean, not that we think these things about Chinese people, but that we narrow our view of what was possible for Chinese people within, the, uh, within Chinese Australian history. So we don't realize, we think that these things are, are true, that Chinese people were simply workers, were market gardeners, that they smoked opium, they were gambling, and you know, that maybe people were unfair about it, but this is the kind of world within which people lived. And really that's not true. There was a much broader world and we haven't quite overthrown this whitewashing that's gone on as a result of this uh, racist stereotyping and also, uh, of course, the white Australia policy, which I'll talk about later on. And I'll. I want to give an example of what I mean by this, um, the power of this whitewashing when I show, if you look at the, the octopus here and then you look at uh, Chinese opera in Australia. And now I've mentioned this before, uh, this idea that uh, Chinese opera existed in Australia. And I don't mean it just that it was occasional um, performances. I mean, these were performances that existed uh, right around Australia, reached their peak at the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Advertised in the English language newspapers were uh, seen by Europeans uh, often put on specially for Europeans in some of the small country towns and people were aware of it and uh, knew about it, made jokes about it. Uh, they didn't always appreciate uh, what they were seeing, but they certainly uh, realized it was part of the overall uh, Chinese Australian community. Something that we've forgotten and forgotten so well that we kind of find it difficult to believe that this was a normal part uh, of the history. Uh, you can see here from uh, where the locations were where Chinese opera existed, beginning in the goldfields of Victoria, but by the end of the 19th century, going up and down the East Coast, particularly uh, in uh, Northern uh, Queensland. And it wasn't just about touring uh, groups from China either. Uh, this was a, a hall in Surrey Hills in Sydney, where a local group trained uh, and performed. Uh, the Liao Tian Ban uh, would perform and it would put on operas usually paid for by a merchant or a rich group. Uh, they would pay for them to perform and then it, then it was free for anybody to go in and, and see. Uh, and then they also uh, played in Sydney, uh, Castle Ray Street, Sonic Hall and other places, and then would tour up uh, into, um, uh, into Queensland as well and visit small towns and put on performances for hospitals and other benefits as well, which is a common style of uh, theatrical performance in the 19th century. Uh, in fact, it was so um, uh, connected uh, with the local community that there's even an account here of European women performing on stage, according to this Chinese report. Uh, performance with eight Western beauties dancing like swallows with full makeup appeared before an audience in Sydney over many nights in 1898. Uh, and so this is a, you know, this is part of obviously the integration of communities here. Not that West Chinese opera is performed by everybody, but nevertheless, it's, it's within an element of the community, it's very common. But this fact was only mentioned in the Chinese language newspapers and wasn't, as far as I can see, mentioned in the, the Sydney's English uh, language press. So 
Uh, why? Why is this, this, these aspects of Chinese Australian uh, history being forgotten? And of course, the answer is to do with the Federation, the White Australia policy, and the dictation test. I spent a bit of time talking about what that uh, actually meant. So the Commonwealth of Australia uh, passed its Immigration Restriction Act in 1901. This was an act that was uh, resisted by London, uh, mostly in the interests of its relations with its colony of India, which of course were normally all British subjects and therefore should have been free to come to Australia as they wished. And also with the Empire of Japan, which was considered uh, an ally of, of England, of Britain at the time. So in, in interest of London's resistance, the colonies in Australia, the Commonwealth of Australia agreed to impose a dictation test, which was the idea was to, to have racially based immigration restrictions, but without referring to any particular race or country by name as, for example, the Labor Party would have preferred. And so who was to be admitted to Australia was going to be left entirely to the discretion of officials. And there were exemptions, but they were few and mostly uh, temporary. Uh, and, and an interesting feature to remember is that for Chinese people who were already resident in Australia before 1901, they were allowed to remain, they weren't to be exposed, expelled, and they would uh, come in and out of Australia as well, uh, if they wished, provided they could get a certificate, uh, which was known as the Certificate of Exempting uh, the Dictation Test. And this is very important for the continuity of the, uh, of the Chinese Australian community and also how it evolved in, in, in the 20th century. So the idea of the dictation test, uh, exactly how uh, fraudulent it was, is, uh, is it, uh, it was well known at the time, although it has, again, been one of these things that have been a bit forgotten as years go by. This is, an, again, another bulletin cartoon in which they were discussing the dictation test and they defined it as Australia's lie for Britain's sake. It's not the colour, it's the spelling. And so when, when they referred to the spelling, they, of course, meant the dictation test. And what the dictation test was, was literally this uh, 50 words or so that would be dictated to a person uh, at dictation speed, supposedly, and they were expected to write it down, or rather they weren't expected to write it down. And if they failed to write it down, they would be then classified as a prohibited immigrant. They just say literally they were uh, uh, accused of a, uh, or convicted of a crime, having failed to pass the test. Uh, the exception, of course, is if you get a dictation, uh, certificate exempting the dictation test. And just to emphasize what a dictation test was, uh, it was literally a blank uh, sheet of paper uh, because the idea being that if you were uh, possibly to begin to write down the words being dictated to you, that your English was sufficient or you could read and write in English, then the test would simply be given in another language. And it could be given in any European language or any prescribed language. And this is an example of a test given in Estonia in 1952 to a Chinese person who had been living in Australia for about a year or so, working as a cook in various cafes before he was uh, 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 given the dictation test and ar therefore arrested as a prohibited immigrant, immigrant. And the test could be given in many, many languages, Greek, Italian, Estonian, Swedish, even Scots Gaelic in a famous test, uh, which we'll talk about uh, later on when it comes up in the 19, uh, 1930s. Now, just before we move on, again, it's important to realise that the White Australia policy, of course, affected a large number of people, not just Chinese people. And in particular, it's interesting to look at the uh, situation of the South of the Islanders, who had been coming to Australia for many years, some 62,000 had been brought over many years to work in Queensland in various uh, industries. Um, but they were told that they had to leave. In fact, there was even a special act, Pacific Islanders Act, that was enacted to try and get rid of the some 9,000 or more Pacific Islanders that were in Australia in 1901. It, like many of these things, it wasn't entirely successful. Some 2,000 managed to remain. Uh, and then and now you could just have a present day Pacific Islander community uh, in Australia. So that was one uh, example of quite a different uh, uh, treatment of one group compared to uh, the Chinese. Um, Similarly, with those working in the, in the pearl shell industry, just to show the pragmatic attitudes uh, of uh, the White Australia policy. Uh, around 1900, there were some 3,000 people living in Broome, for example, which was a major centre of the pearl shell industry, uh, of either Asian or South Asian origin, as well as Indigenous people, and about 1,000 white people. And uh, Broome's Chinatown was quite flourishing with pearl sheds and eatery and entertainment for the divers of this industry. Um, and this was allowed under the White Australia policy and continued uh, right through the period, uh, despite various efforts to try and turn it into a white only um, 
uh, industry, which, which failed like many other efforts to do this, quite a number of efforts to try and exclude people from various industries. In this case, it failed, uh, but simply because uh, the idea was that white people couldn't do this kind of work. Uh, and just remember, uh, when we talk about pearls, we're not talking about pearls as such, we're talking about pearl shell made into buttons. This was the major industry. Uh, and Broome was one of the centres, as was Darwin uh, and Thursday Island. Now, the other thing is that just as it's not pearls, it's pearl shell rather than pearls, uh, Chinese in Australia were not just market gardeners. And this is, again, and it's something that's worth emphasising because, again, the whitewashing of the history has kind of given us a very narrow view of what Chinese people were doing uh, in Australia. Uh, not only were they not just market gardeners, uh, although at one stage, perhaps 40% uh, of Chinese working in Australia were working as market gardeners, and many did work, do that for short periods of time while they did other businesses. It was a very lucrative business. Um, but they also worked, of course, in tin, was very important. Gold uh, continued to do uh, prospecting. Railways in, Northern, in Northern, the Northern Territory, market gardening, of course, boat building, fishing, carpentry, cooks, and barbers were all some of the occupations that people worked at. Uh, tree panging off the coast of Queensland, opera, as I mentioned before. Temples, not just having temples, but people had to build these temples, had to um, stock them and look after them. Ca newspapers and many uh, Chinese language newspapers were established at the end of the 19th and in the early period of the 20th century. Uh, international trade, as I mentioned, uh, trade networks around pearl shelling, hawking, uh, moving around, selling goods uh, around the countryside. Uh, tobacco, corn and bananas. Uh, at one point, and in certain regions, uh, Chinese farmers uh, dominated some of these industries uh, for various periods of time. Scrub cutting, again, was very important. Uh, Chinese labor gangs were very well organized and weren't, and it wasn't a question of them necessarily being paid less. It was simply being, being that they were better uh, at the job they did and so were worth the money they were paid. Medicine, Chinese doctors were very popular, particularly in Victoria. And gambling, again, gambling was something seen as a crime. But of course, someone had to run these gambling establishments and, and make money out of it. And this is all part of the occupations people did. Shopkeeping uh, was very important. And some rural towns survived only on the, on the Chinese uh, networks of shops. So was banking, uh, not just uh, domestic banking, but also remittances as money was sent back to the villages. And it's not uh, unsurprising that some of these uh, Chinese businesses set up banking industries, insurance industries in Hong Kong and Shanghai in a later period. Uh, Christian missions, again, not just about white missionaries trying to convert people to Christianity. Chinese Christians became missionaries themselves, set up their own churches and tried to convert uh, people as well. Community organisations become very important. Um, they always were important on a dialect basis, but they become more general. Chinese organisations, organisations for helping people, uh, not just clubs, but they help people to go back to China if they were sick, uh, help pay them money uh, and dealt, help them deal with immigration matters. Political organisations, of course, uh, become important at this time. Uh, again, again, uh, reform of the Qing and later revolutionary organisations. Smuggling, if you're going to have a hundred pound poll tax, then that means people are going to try and avoid that tax and this has to be organised. And they, were, they weren't hit and miss organisations, they were syndicates that operated uh, from Australia back to Hong Kong and back into the villages. Uh, restaurants were very popular, not just cheap eateries, but also some high-end businesses in Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, and finally, interpreters, again, dealing with uh, mainland English-speaking officialdom. Interpreters in, in the courts were always important from Gold Rush period right up uh, into the 20th, 20th century. So you can see there's quite a range of occupations that people uh, are dealing with. And numbers two uh, are also important. You can see in the period from 1881 to 1891, You've got some 11,000 people living in uh, Chinese people living in Queensland, a uh, similar amount number in New South Wales, similar number in Victoria, and smaller numbers scattered around other parts of Australia. So all over Australia, uh, tin mining down in Tasmania, for example. Um, the poll taxes and the restrictions are already beginning to bite, and you can see some decline in numbers in Queensland uh, and Victoria. But uh, New South Wales is still continuing to increase, mainly because of people coming down from Queensland into into New South Wales. And the thing to remember about these people, these thousands of people, tens of thousands of people around Australia, is that uh, although we, as I say, uh, in history, we talk about them as being Chinese people, they themselves thought of themselves as being from particular districts and dialect groups. So they were Zhongshan people, Siyap people, Samyap people, Dongguan or Gaoyao people and, uh, and others. 
uh, and this is important, uh, it becomes, they become, they think of themselves more and more as Chinese as time goes by, but in this period, this is important. It's important for who you relate to, important to who your children will marry, important for many, many reasons. Uh, mostly came from via Hong Kong, from southern China through Hong Kong, but also down uh, through to Singapore, particularly uh, to Western Australia. Uh, and overall, a lot of these numbers are, seem large, though never more than about 2% of the population, although in particular areas, much larger. So Cairns at one point had more than 50% Chinese population, as did Darwin. So it varied depending on where people were, but in general, the numbers were quite small in percentage terms. Now in the period <clears throat> leading up to Federation, you see again, uh, the increased poll taxes of, of 1881 are having more of an effect as declines now in New South Wales. Victoria, Tasmania also is going down. Queensland's up a little bit in numbers, again, because, probably because of people moving across from the Northern Territory into Queensland. West Australia continues to grow. You can see the, 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 uh, the um, enforcement of these restrictions are not uniform. Queens, uh, uh, New South Wales and Victoria are much more keen at trying to enforce anti-Chinese legislation. West Australia, not so much at this period. <coughs> And what's more important here, um, you can see in the square brackets, I've got numbers there, 100 in Queensland, 100 in, in uh, New South Wales. These are the numbers of Chinese women that are uh, in Australia. So a small number compared to the number of men. But more significant is the number of Chinese family couples. That is to say, men who are married to local women in Queensland or New South Wales or wherever. So New South Wales had an estimated at this period, 1,000 Chinese family couples. Queensland, similar number. Victoria, some 700. Now this is significant um, because this means families, this means people being born, and this will have a big impact on the makeup of the population of the community in later, uh, later decades. Uh, of course, not so much now, but later on as they grow up, you have much more of a range of mix, not people just China born, but Australian born and, and others. <clears throat> so then in the period uh, after Federation, after the beginning of the uh, White Australia policy leading up to 1911, you've got declines uh, all around Australia, significant declines, particularly in Queensland uh, and Victoria, uh, as <coughs> excuse me, as people return to China, uh, retire, and no, new, new numbers of people are not allowed to come in, or relatively few numbers uh, are brought in. There's always people coming in, but but uh, certainly the numbers are much down on what they had been previously. So the communities begin to decline. Although uh, because of urbanization, some of the numbers in Sydney and Melbourne begin to grow as people come from the rural areas into the urban, urban centers. Uh, but the important thing to remember that in this period, they're beginning becoming more mixed. There are people who are Australian born and Australian raised, but there are also people who are China born and raised. There are people who are Australian born, but raised in China. There are people born in, Australia, in China, but then are brought to Australia when young and raised basically in Australia. And so of course, there are many people mixed mixed parentage, which means they have different choices, different uh, ways of identifying uh, themselves. And it's important to remember that there have been a mixture of different ways of communicating. Some are bilingual, some are mon monolingual, some speak a dialect, some speak just Cantonese, some speak only English, or some mixture of all of these. And this again is important to how people communicate and relate to each other and the choices they have uh, in their lives. It's never as simple as simply being Chinese or not. So this brings us to the other important question is what perspective do we uh, view all these things? Uh, do we look at it from a white perspective or a Chinese perspective? Uh, or do we look at, it, of course, both? Uh, if we look at it from a white perspective, which is very common in history, then Chinese people in Australia are going to be seen as either victims or as resistors. So we're going to focus on things like discrimination, resistance, and accommodation. Uh, and there's going to be ongoing, uh, ongoing history of things of social and legal racism is going to be uh, emphasized. Uh, opium uh, organizations, challenges, smuggling, for example, all of this is going to be part of the history and all of this is part of the history. But if you look at it from a, a Chinese perspective, you're going to see things a little bit differently. You're going to see things, you're going to see Chinese people as earners, as I say, their main uh, aim in coming to Australia was to earn money for their families in, in China by and large, or people had other choices. They're going to be simply, of course, human beings struggling with the various aspects of modern life. In this case, modernity. This is a period of time when many things were changing. There were revolutions, there was democracy, there was electricity and telephones, all kinds of things were happening to change uh, the world uh, uh, at this time. And people knew that, Chinese people knew that as well as Australians, uh, European Australians. And so in particular, when they're looking at China, 
They're looking at uh, increasingly a sense that things need to reform, not just politically, but also culturally, uh, and even to perhaps revolution. It's a period then where things like, say, the big four are being founded. That's to say major department stores and businesses and industries that will have a significant impact in Shanghai and Hong Kong. Yeah, more about that in the later lecture. Family, of course, continues to be important. Novels are written, newspapers are established, which are full of all kinds of news and arguments and debates. Picnics, people go off and entertain themselves and enjoy uh, modern life. It's all about then a human diversity and individuality. And now, very often the one way to can try and convey this human diversity and individuality is to focus on particular families or particular individuals. Uh, but that kind of gives us a, a continually um, uh, individual view, but I still like to have an overview of what's going on. So what I'll do instead is give you a quick rundown of what's happening. Whoops, I'm not losing, losing my power here. Here we go. So just to try and convey a sense of the human diversity within the Chinese Australian community uh, in this period. Now we have, of course, market gardeners. You know, we always know the market gardener stereotype, and they certainly existed and were very important, uh, particularly for vegetable production. It's not too much of an illustration to say that the vegetables for Australians at this period of time were largely grown, not exclusively, but nevertheless, certainly the Chinese market gardeners did dominate. But they did other things. They played football, for example. This is a Chinese football team down in uh, Victoria. Uh, another stereotype has to do with uh, carpentry and carpenters, uh, but people did other things such as raced and rode the modern uh, device of the bicycle. Always, uh, it's important to remember that people had family in the villages and what they were doing was sending money back. And while many people in Australia regarded a market gardener as a very poor, humble kind of job that didn't earn much money, in China, they were making a lot of money. And this is a house built by a Sydney market gardener, for example, in a street full of houses of a similar style. And they were considered to be quite wealthy. And this is what they were doing with their money. They were expanding the family, making the family uh, wealthier, more comfortable, you get more prestige. And this is, again, an important part of the connection and the link uh, and people's reasons for doing uh, what they did. As I said, they also entertained themselves. They went around the countryside, they had picnics. This was a, a, a network of um, uh, shopkeepers within a rural network who were taking annual picnics for the staff, both white and Chinese uh, in this context. Um, I've mentioned opera, of course, uh, as entertainment and also as money earners and cultural um, um, relevance there, as does uh, his, his temples. Uh, this is a temple from, there, was a, um, uh, there were five temples established in Tasmania, for example, on the basis of the wealth earned from tin mining. And what people did was they would go back to China and bring all this material back in order to stock the temple with, uh, with quite luxurious uh, artifacts and uh, um, images. Family, again, is important. And as I say, mixed family, uh, mixed uh, race families, mixed cultural families, with children growing up, uh, knowing a variety of languages and a variety of cultural uh, backgrounds. Uh, politics, the um, again, increasingly important, uh, the reform of the Qing, um, uh, and, and these were international organizations, not just kind of local groups within Sydney, but they were groups that were established I think back to China, but also around the Pacific and all around Southeast Asia as well. Uh, again, individuals did all kinds of things. This is uh, William Marquette, who was the first Chinese Australian um, barrister in, uh, in, down in Victoria. Uh, and so he went his own way. And then many others became professionals also, although very often they chose to do their professional careers in Hong Kong or in Singapore, although William Marquette remained in Melbourne. Uh, and finally, of course, business is very important. Uh, wide ranges of businesses that were both um, domestic. This is a Sydney-based store, the Mong Wo Chong, but this store also had um, branches in Hong Kong and in Shecky in uh, southern China, and it, re it sent remittances and played a major role within the community, both in terms of the goods it sold, the international trade it did, and also the connections and the, and the support it gave to people within the community. But it was Zhongshan based. Let's say it did this for the Zhongshan community, one particular dialect group uh, and other stores, other businesses did so for other groups uh, within the community. So it's still a mixture, although the proprietor of this store, the owner, uh, Philip Lee Chong, also considered himself as part of a wider Chinese business community and, and began to join and to help organize overall businesses that considered themselves to be Chinese in a broader 
broader sense. So we're after a period of change and evolution. Now, I talk about the range of uh, uh, activities that are happening here and, and, and having a Chinese perspective, but I don't want to then downplay racism. And so I just want to emphasize here some of the kind of underpinnings of racism, or at least I give an example of how the racism would have influenced people on a daily basis, even while they were doing a range of other things, uh, how this worked on a social and uh, a legal basis. And also to emphasize that this was not, never consistent. There are always exceptions. So it's, it's an inconsistency here that makes it uh, that should be kept it bit worn in mind. We shouldn't try and make things too simple. So to illustrate racism, this is a, a, an observation made by a magistrate who was hearing a case of some gamblers, some Chinese gamblers had been arrested. And he was sympathetic to the gamblers. And so he said, if a Chinaman went to a play or a picture show, he usually was to be found in one of the dearest seats, no doubt to protect himself from the unwelcome attentions he would receive in other parts of the house. So for this magistrate, he well knew that it wasn't even possible for a Chinese person to simply go along to the theater without finding himself being harassed and that he probably had needed to find the receipts. But for his point of view, they were gambling because they were, their, their range of activities, the range of entertainments they had was relatively restricted. So that was a kind of a, an illustration of a social aspect of the racism. Now for the legal aspect, uh, this is often very hard to illustrate. We know that dictation tests were very uniform and consistent and, and existed over many periods, many years. But there were many other laws that were kind of seen as racist and directed against Chinese and other people, but we're not totally sure how effective or impact they had. Nevertheless, the context is clear. So this is a law introduced by the federal government for the idea of paying bounties on particular crops that they wanted to encourage to be grown. And the law said we will only pay the bounty if these crops have been grown or produced by white labor only. So a clearly racist law. But they had to immediately um, bring in an exception, a qualification to this, because obviously, you know, how are you going to get things grown by white labour only, particularly in areas where white labour wasn't very keen to grow things? And so the exception was that, oh, well, that's okay, as long as if, it's, if the employment of any Aboriginal native of Australia or of any coloured person born in Australia and having white, white, one white parent, then the bounty continues to be paid. So this makes it very difficult to, to see exactly what impact such laws had. They were certainly a racist content, but very often probably not a great deal of impact. And many of these kinds of laws were in fact withdrawn after relatively short periods of time because they were simply unworkable. But the other thing I want to point out is the exceptions to all this kind of underlying racism. This was um, West Australia. Foundation Stone of the Zhonghua Association was laid this afternoon by the very aptly named Sir Ed Stone, Lieutenant Governor. And this official recognition of the Chinese communities uh, was very common all around Australia. Uh, happened in Victoria, happened in uh, Tasmania, Queensland and other places. So, you know, with all kinds of social and legal racism going on and, and discriminations, you've also got acceptance and uh, even, even some uh, cooperation going on. So again, nothing is very consistent uh, within, this, within this history. Uh, but we do get some clear examples of some things that are happening. And now I said before that uh, because of urbanization, the Chinese population of Sydney and Melbourne actually began to grow, even as the overall population was declining. And this caused some problems within these urban centres. And so in May 1904, uh, an anti-Chinese league or anti-Asiatic league was established. And this was an amalgamation of both small businesses and uh, trade union people to kind of try and pressure and attack um, Chinese businesses, particularly shops, uh, carpenter businesses and so forth. Uh, and the interesting result of this particular um, uh, league, two things happened. One was that they, these leagues were so keen that they actually sent people out into the countryside where they often were disappointed and found that in the countryside, people weren't so keen to do this kind of discrimination. They were quite happy to have cheap laundry done or have uh, them get the credit from a, a business that was run by a well-established Chinese family. Uh, but in the Sydney, on the other hand, in July, soon after, um, the anti-China league was established. The Sydney Chinese merchants uh, formed their own association, the New South Wales Chinese Merchants Defence Association, to attack and to defend against this kind of um, um, uh, discrimination. Uh, and it, so not only is that interesting in terms of the way they responded, but of course it's also interesting in that they call themselves the Chinese Merchants Defence Association. So again, it's another example of this early kind of umbrellaing everybody under, under a banner of being Chinese. The other uh, more characteristic way people dealt with this kind of discrimination was to try 
and deal with it on a, by accommodating. And one of the most interesting aspects of this was the Israel Chinese Anti-Opium League. Um, so the Chinese merchants had realized that opium had become a, a kind of, um, uh, was seen as something that only the Chinese did and, was, and it was leading to great disrespect of the Chinese community. Uh, they themselves necessarily didn't, of course, uh, uh, like the idea of people using opium. Um, if it had been perfectly legal um, up until this period of time. It had always been legal in Australia to import it and to sell it. Uh, so this, New South Wales Chinese Anti-Opium League succeeded in getting opium uh, banned in New South Wales in 1906. And they did this in order to, they were hoping to raise the prestige of the Chinese community. They did it by working with people like W.E. Johnson there, who in fact was a, a prime supporter of the white Australia policy. So again, uh, much inconsistency going on here as people struggle uh, to deal with uh, a changing, a changing environment. Now, part of that environment uh, was one of both local and international uh, anxiety for at least as far as the Chinese community was concerned. So, 1900, uh, one, 1900, for example, two things happened. Uh, there was an outbreak of plague in Sydney, and also the Boxer Rebellion began in China. And both these things caused much anxiety. Uh, for the Chinese people of, of Sydney, for example. So Sydney City Council uh, responded to the plague by tearing down a lot of houses, destroying uh, an area of Sydney around Sur Surrey Hills, particularly Wexford Street disappeared, and it evicted many Chinese residents uh, without compensation. And this caused a lot of, of course, anger, as you can imagine, and it made for, at, at one point for fear among the Chinese community that they were going to be expelled from the city completely. This didn't happen, but they did fear this at one point. Similarly, with the Boxer Rebellion, which was uh, targeted uh, largely at um, Europeans in China, uh, including many deaths as a result, uh, this caused some anxiety uh, for the Chinese community who felt that they were then being play, uh, targeted as, as enemies of Europeans. Now, the Chinese community responded to this by actually contributing to the New, New South Wales contingent. So the New South Wales Regiment sent, uh, as did Victoria and other places, sent a contingent to uh, Beijing to help uh, defend the Europeans against the boxers and the Chinese, Sydney Chinese community actually um, supported this. But they did this not um, because they were trying just to, to get in good with Europeans. They did this because they perceived the boxers as being a, a, an anti-modern movement. They did not appreciate necessarily the aims of the boxers. Um, and, and this meant that they were in, in a kind of a bit of a quandary. Uh, just as an aside here, uh, to illustrate this, this is a bell um, uh, from a temple in Beijing that's now in the Powerhouse Museum in Sydney, brought back by that same New South Wales contingent as a bit of spoils, spoils of war. So, reform or revolution? For the Chinese elite in, in Sydney and Melbourne and, and around Australia, it was about modernity, it was about reform. Uh, the Boxer Rebellion uh, did a great deal of damage to, the, to those that were supporting the reform of the Qing. Uh, and, and more and more, increasingly, people began to argue for revolution, for a need to completely change uh, China. And they argued this through various tools of modernity, which of course included uh, the newspapers. Uh, there were many newspapers established, the Dunghua Times were one that tended to go for a more conservative view, and others argued for more revolutionary uh, views. And this was the context within which people are operating as we come towards the beginning of uh, um, uh, the end of the last decade of the 20th century. Now, how this modernity played itself out is interesting. I'll just give one example of that in the case of this man named Wang Xiping. Now, Wang Xiping was the son of a Chinese gold miner, a man who had gone, left the village uh, and come to Victoria, worked as a gold miner and been very successful. Come back to China, come back to uh, Victoria, set up businesses in Melbourne uh, and his son, uh, was, had been educated, was a Christian, and his son in turn had come, also come to Victoria where he worked as an uh, editor of a newspaper and where he promoted Christianity. He was a missionary. He, went, he traveled around Australia trying to convert people. He was a proponent of, of revolutionary republicanism. He wanted to reform China completely. He believed China needed to modernize, not just politically, but also uh, culturally. And one of these was also that women should be more equal. So it was a very strong Thing that he uh, argued for, as did many others at this time. And he even wrote uh, a novel at one stage, The Poison of Polygamy, which he serialized in his newspaper around 1909 and 1910. So all the tools of modernity were being employed by Wang Xiping. And he was by no means uh, an exception in this, uh, in this period. 
Uh, and so you can see that people had choices, uh, choices were to be made, choices about where to go, uh, what to do, and how to identify themselves. So in conclusion, uh, I'd just like to say then that this period, uh, 1911, uh, 1981 to 1911, was both, as I said before, both a high and a low point in China's Australian history, transformed by both the rise in white nationalism in Australia, uh, and also by modernity and the rise uh, of republicanism in China. I say rise or the rise of these sort of revolutionary movements uh, within China. And all of this meant that choices uh, were, had to be made, choices in, both imposed upon people, as well as those uh, to be made by themselves. A choices such as to assimilate, and many people did. Uh, many families erased the Chinese past. Even today, there are people finding out, uh, unbeknownst to them, that they had Chinese ancestors, grandfathers and great-grandfathers going back uh, into the 19th century that had been eliminated as others, as people chose to assimilate and to change their names and to ignore their Chinese past. But many others, of course, chose to stick uh, within the Chinese community, to return to China, to maintain language, uh, uh, and to deal um, with this continually uh, transnational history that, uh, that had been evolving. Uh, others, of course, took up more of a halfway position. So perhaps they lost their language, but not their identity, uh, or they evolved new identities. Uh, and as always, it's difficult to determine proportions. We can describe various individuals who did various things, uh, but it's very difficult to always say you know, that most people did this or most people did that. Uh, but we should be aware of the range uh, of possibilities as we look uh, through the history. And so I'll just leave you then there with a, a list of um, readings, suggested readings if you want to do more, or you can look on the Chinese Australian uh, History um, website uh, to find out these uh, bibliographies and things. And otherwise, I will now um, say thank you very much for your attention and hand back to Jin to perhaps if we have some questions or whatever to go through. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. And thank you, Michael. It's really interesting. And you can see that it's just so packed with uh, content, you know, of lots of things you could elaborate more, like a dictation test and opera and the novel, uh, quite a few things. So it's uh, full of um, uh, events and history. It's a really rich history. It's very, very interesting. And now we open to questions. I have a few questions on the... Um, Q&A already, and then I have a couple of questions of myself. So I start with the viewers' questions first. Uh, the first one is from Rich. Uh, he says, in view of the white Australian policy, was there an, an attempt to expel uh, and repatriate the Chinese already living in Australia, similar to Pacific Islanders? Well, no. The treatment of the Chinese was quite different in comparison to Pacific Islanders who were targeted and meant to be expelled. What did happen though, was they did try to kind of squeeze people out of particular jobs. This particularly happened up in Darwin, for example, where the Chinese population was much larger. And so there were efforts to, for example, close down the fishery industry at one stage. Um, and there were efforts to kind of squeeze people out of the pearl industry that didn't work. Uh, you know, various efforts, uh, there were laws about, you know, not working, carrying mails, uh, the post office, unless you were uh, white and this kind of thing. So this of course made it difficult, but it never got to the point of actually trying to expel anybody. There was a brief period where it looked like they weren't going to give um, certificates or exemptions to people and they were going to have to leave and not come back. But that, in fact, caused quite a bit of uh, anxiety among well, not just the Chinese community, but others, because they realised that that would be all the market gardeners would be disappearing and they wouldn't be coming back to grow vegetables. So, in fact, they changed and relaxed the laws and made sure that pretty well anybody who had been resident in Australia before 1901 would get um, a certificate of exemption and would therefore be allowed to return to Australia if they wished. Nevertheless, they did make it difficult sometimes when people were coming back. Um, uh, people who had to be fingerprinted, searched, they were often suspected of being not who they said they were. And so some people were, were, were not allowed to enter Australia who perhaps were in fact uh, eligible. Uh, so there, you know, there were certainly individual cases where people were, it made it difficult and perhaps and we, it's hard to tell how many people just chose not to come back because it was too too difficult or too, um, just too much bureaucracy or or just didn't want to go for the hassle. But there was, certainly wasn't a kind of concerted effort to, to throw large numbers of people out and certainly nothing like what happened with the Pacific Islanders, no. Okay, the next question from Daryl. The Chinese were also pioneering in many industries in Australia, especially in the sugar cane industry, banana industry, etc. This adds to your point 
that they were engaged in many other activities than market gardeners. Hence your point on whitewashing of Chinese occupations is a deeper uh, one when one connects their uh, pioneering nature or considers their pioneering nature. How should we address this? Yeah, well, that's uh, that's good. Well, I've, so I've tried to address it by kind of emphasising things like opera and other things, just to say things are well outside the usual stereotype of a market gardener, trying to get through to people that you know there was a lot more going on uh, than this. Other people do by look by looking at uh, individuals and going through life stories, and this is a good way for people to get an idea. They, they look at the history of a person's life and begin to realise uh, that it was a lot more to this person's life than simply working on a market garden or or uh, being a victim of racism. So uh, the more we promote these kinds of things, the better. But I think it's very hard to get through to people's minds um, because, uh, as I say, I've been working in, in an academic field for many years and th this material is all there. In, for the last 20 years, there's been many, many good academic papers and books published that show all this uh, to, a, to, a, to a fair degree. But it doesn't penetrate with the um, popular history or the popular mindset very much. People continue to think Chinese gold, Chinese market gardens, and they don't go much beyond that. Um, and, and it's, I think uh, all we can do is continue to have venues like this to continue to try and popularize things. Recently, I saw uh, the ABC had a very interesting program called um, uh, How Tough Was Your Ancestors? I hadn't realized this before, and it's a children's program. And the idea is to pick someone's ancestor, show what terrible things they were doing back in the 19th century, keep making kids do, and get kids to do the same thing. And I thought that was really quite a wonderful way of doing things, particularly trying to target younger kids to show that. But again, you know, the ABC are not historians. So, you know, they were looking at a market gardener actually. Uh, but they did include someone doing not opera, but um, uh, performance. So again, they were mixing market gardening with performance uh, uh, sword dance. So, you know, it, it, was, it was a step. Uh, and again, it's step-by-step it's step step stuff. So the ABC is, is telling stories and trying to entertain people. So that, that was an improvement. They can do better. Uh, and I think we've got to just continually push at this and, and, and make things uh, improve our awareness uh, bit by bit. And I, I think with, with people's increasing interest, particularly so many people aware of their Chinese heritage or of Chinese heritage, they're, 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 they're more wired to, to accept some of this stuff and to know uh, that the history is a lot broader than simply market gardeners and, uh, and racism and so forth. Okay, next a question from Andrew. Um, Andrew asks, are there any records to indicate what expect Ch experts, Chinese or Australian, thought about the decline and the eventual extinction of a Qing dynasty? Oh, well, yes, in the Chinese language newspapers, there's, there's a lot of material. Um, and they're arguing about it all the time. I mean, as I said, some newspapers took a more conservative stance and some newspapers were more revolutionary. So they constantly argued back and forth uh, about what should happen. And of course, there was this increasing sense that the Qing were Manchu. Uh, that is to say that they were foreigners. They weren't. Chinese, they weren't Han Chinese, they were foreign occupiers. And so this increased, uh, uh, and, and this was argued out in the newspapers as well. Uh, so yes, yeah, certainly in terms of the newspapers, there's a lot of material. There's not a lot uh, outside those newspapers. So we're getting the view then of a, of a certain educated elite, um, but they were the ones that were most concerned uh, with politics. As you'd expect, a lot of people who were just intent on looking after their family and going back to the villages perhaps didn't. Um, had, didn't want to concern themselves too much uh, with these, the higher politics and only when they were forced to after the revolution gave them, gave them no choice. But yes, there certainly is a lot of interesting material there, uh, which hasn't been translated very much. We, we could do a lot more. Um, the Poison and Polygamy was from the newspapers, for example, that book, and that was translated. And that gives us a particular view uh, about the Qing and the Manchu. Uh, but there's a lot more material that we could be, um, we should, could and should be translating. Trouble is it's difficult to translate this material because it's written in an old style, very often literary Chinese, sometimes in dialect. Uh, and we need, uh, we don't really have a lot of people who are good uh, or, or are able to do these translations uh, very well. But certainly we can encourage, encourage doing that. And I think we should. The next question I can answer that is asking the available, you know, do we have available uh, lecture one and two? And yes, we do, it's on our website. So it's all being recorded. And so you're more than welcome to get onto the website and watch all the first three. Uh, next, a question from Peter. And that's an interesting question about the uh, you know, bilateral relations in a way. So how would you evaluate the contribution of Chinese people to 
to the change to the changes in Australia um, over this period? Equally, how did Australian experiences influence development in China? Ah, uh, how would I go over the contribution of Chinese people to the change in Australia? Well, um, yes, it's interesting. It, it depends where you look, of course, but I mean, certainly in the north, tremendous uh, uh, impact uh, in northern uh, uh, northern Queensland and in the Northern Territory, um, and not just vegetables, but growing of a whole range of crops opening up, uh, many industries, uh, many many territories around Atherton and so forth. Um, very often, what would happen is that, let's say, Atherton, for example. Uh, it was we white farmers would own the land, but they would lease it out to Chinese to do all the work, you know, to do the, I mean, very often these market gardens, for example, were taking over rough land and doing all the work to turn into cultivatable land, which would then later be taken over by white farmers to do the, the easier growing. So, I mean, you, the Chinese were doing a lot of uh, heavy work, scrub cutting, uh, the, the clearing of the, of the land, particularly in Queensland, was very, um, uh, important in the 19th century as people tried to turn this into an agricultural ag producing area and that meant chopping down trees and clearing the scrub and that was very hard work and again the Chinese gangs mostly did that kind of work so it took a lot, lot of impact uh, in that area. Uh, railways in, in the Northern Territory uh, partly built by Chinese labour not on the scale of in America but nevertheless a significant contribution uh, in this area. Um, so yes, yeah, quite a range of, 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 um, of impacts. But by and large, a lot of it had to do, I mean, I didn't first talk about a lot, the other more negative impact is of course this othering, uh, this is kind of hammering out of this idea of whiteness against the Chinese, you know, this idea that, you know, we're not Chinese, what are we? We are Australians and Australian by definition is this kind of white non-Chinese thing. So there's an, a lot of strong element of that, which, which was the, what, what the whitewashing was serving to do was to establish Australia Australia's images of themselves. I haven't kind of focused on that too much in this lecture, but I will more in the next one, that how this is uh, in many ways, Chinese were the anvil against which the white Australia was, um, was established. And this is a, a psychological thing um, as much as any kind of a practical matter of reducing numbers or, or turning Australia into a homogenous uh, uh, country de demographically. Hmm. I insert uh, one of my questions uh, because at the end of the lecture, you talk about assimilation and what happened to all these Chinese um, migrants in the end, you know, some are assimilated and others not and returned in all sorts. So it just reminds me, uh, because there were so many Chinese uh, back then, the number obviously led to a strong sense of a resentment or discrimination, that's part of it. How come there were no uh, uh, assimilation intention, you know, uh, what I'm referring to, you know, the government did a systematic assimilation to indigenous population. Um, why there was none, I mean, not necessarily a good thing, but I'm just curious to know. Yeah, why didn't why the Chinese population wasn't treated the same way as the Aboriginal yes, population? why didn't they try to, children so why in Australia and why didn't they assimilate, uh, you know, Chinese in, in that way? Um, well, I think two reasons. One was that they, they, they never looked upon Chinese quite so contemptuously as they did Aboriginal people. I mean, uh, I mean the white attitude towards Aboriginal people was very contemptuous and very much like these people have no rights. They're barely human. There's they're certainly nothing in their culture. Uh, I mean, they might dislike Chinese people as an individual or in racist terms, but they never were quite that contemptuous and of course they recognized that they they relied on them for a whole range of things so they never attempted to suppress chinese culture their attitude was much more segregationist than assimilationist so what they would do uh if they could uh, and this came went back to the gorish time was not so much to assimilate chinese people but simply put them in a, a separate area you know they're happy with so that's why you have chinatowns or chinese areas and this idea that oh, that's just where the chinese live that's okay as long as they stay in that area Although, of course, they never were exclusively Chinese Chinatowns, these places. They were often just simply poor areas or a particular town or area where a lot of poor people live, like working class and, and semi-slum areas. And so, in fact, you had a mixture of Chinese and, and non-Chinese people living together and often living, well, well I won't say harmoniously, they, but they weren't necessarily on, at, uh, antagonistic to each other in the same way, say, a middle-class white person who happened to be just walking through the Chinatown might, and writing a, a newspaper report might sound, you know, they go past and they, oh, these, these people are terrible, these people uh, are dirty, blah, 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 and then go home. 
I mean, there's other people who live right next door and they, and they live in very similar circumstances. And so they never describe things quite that way. So it's much more segregationist more than anything else. Um, uh, although again, Australia didn't, certainly didn't have any policy like that. They, there was no separate schools, for example. These Chinese kids grew up, they just went to a local school. Whereas Aboriginal children very often weren't allowed to go to these same schools. There was a separation and they, they found much more difficult of education. So again, very, very different attitude. There's no comparison between the, the way Chinese people were looked at and Aboriginal people. It's a, a, two, different, two different completely worlds. But a good question because it does bring up that, that situation that they, yeah. it's racism, but it's not a yeah. uniform racism. It's very much a, a pragmatic thing and a, and a way of dealing dealing with people in a different yeah, that's different really interesting yeah very interesting uh natalie has a question michael thanks for the comprehensive overview in terms of merchants could you explain a bit about their role in terms of organizing chinese communities and from your research have you found that many chinese merchants came as merchants or you know they came as laborers laborers about gained a social status and became merchants were there much social mobility within Chinese communities? Yes, well, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. The, just to answer the second part first, yes. I mean, we certainly have stories of people who came as laborers and worked and then, and then became merchants. So there's this kind of classic style of people, you know, gradually you know, saving money and becoming very wealthy from a very humble beginnings. And this is a, a, a very common story right around the Chinese diaspora of people doing that. Um, but it's also true that people often did come with capital or even if they did work, for periods of time they were working because they were working for an uncle or a father who had the money and so this they might well have worked spent their time working as laborers but they never had access to the capital and labor through family networks that allowed them to kind of increase their wealth over time buy out partnerships so it's, it's but it's, it's hard to tell exactly what's happening the story is usually told in terms of poor to rich you know from rags to riches kind of style because that's the classic migrant tale where everybody tells this story and it's very common within chinese communities but i suspect You've got when you take into account their networks and their, and their ability to borrow money from relatives and and do this kind of thing, which is all part of the, of, of the community way of working. Uh, this is important. They weren't complete lone wolves who just did it all themselves. They weren't self-made men in the kind of the American uh, style necessarily. I mean, were, I'm sure there were a few, but uh, but they certainly worked hard. But they used their networks. They used their connections. They started with partnerships and perhaps uh, as people returned to China, they bought those partnerships out and eventually became the sole owners and therefore wealthy merchants in their own right as they would then took all the profits. They of course had, to, had the ability to do that, but they did it within a certain social context, which I think is important. Um, the other part of the question about uh, in terms of organizing the community, yes, the merchant class was absolutely important. They were, they were the ones, again, it was a hierarchical kind of way of looking at things and the merchants were considered to be the ones that were responsible for the community. So you were, again, it's part of this networking. So you had a Jungshan group, for example, a Lungdu group, and yes, the merchants tended to kind of be in control of that organization, but they did it to help everybody. I mean, everybody was expected to be helped. If someone was lost their money or, or needed help returning, then the community organizers would help them. But the money mainly came from the wealthier merchants. Uh, but at the same time, you went to that merchant store and you, and you bought his goods and you paid your remittance through him to go back to uh, send the money back to China. And he, of course, took his 10%. So, you know, it all worked. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in a way that everybody got something out of it, which is typical of these kind of communities that were operated as Chinese communities had for many years on the village basis, networked kind of a semi-relative basis. Everybody was an uncle or a cousin or somebody was, if you weren't really related, then you acted as if that was, that person was your uncle and then you expected to um, get some, some benefit from that both ways. So yes, yeah, certainly the merchant class was very important, but it's, it's just not as easy as saying the rich people did this and the poorer people did that. It's a, it's a much more complex cultural mix, which is changing over time, of course. You can't say it's, it's the same all the time. It's, it's certainly evolving, uh, particularly as people begin to be more conscious of being Chinese merchants and the Chinese Chamber of Commerce is uh, uh, established. But it's interesting, you know, the Chinese Chamber of Commerce is established, but it's established with representatives from all the different dialect groups. So it's kind of a compromise when it's first established. But later on, that becomes less and less uh, important. Uh, but certainly, yes, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. You've got to look at the, how these things were operating. But I think the networks and the connections are very important that lead go right back to the village, back and forth all the time. Uh, so family relations are as important as any kind of business relations or the two are often, often the same, I think, particularly in this period. 
Sorry, I've lost you. Jenny, you talking now? I can't hear. Yep. Okay, next a question okay. is yep. uh, from Gil. Uh, did to the CEDT entitle the holder to bring the child into Australia that was born outside Australia, subsequent to the issue of the CEDT? What no. about so, Sorry, yes, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, you know, no, it didn't. The CDT gave you no rights except for yourself. Uh, the bringing in of uh, children and, and uh, wives, this has had to be organised quite separately. Um, and and uh, there was another certificate called a certificate of exemption as opposed to a CDT, which people could get uh, to bring in children or wives. It was possible. Uh, usually they brought in temporarily. There had to be a, a reason. Like children were often brought in um, to work, to go to study with students. Usually younger, uh, younger children go learn English or go to a school. Uh, wives could be brought in. Um, again, merchants were able to do that usually for six months at a time, but then they could get them extended. Again, not, not always, it wasn't always possible. People could even may, were made to leave when the children were born in Australia. The mothers were made to leave. There were quite a number of cases. So it's quite a complicated business, but that was quite outside the certificate of exemptions, which were specifically for those who had been resident before 1901. After 1901, uh, it's a different ball game and a much more complicated one, which I will talk about more in the next lecture, where I'll go into that whole system that devolved and how that affected the community um, and the dealings with the, um, uh, well, not immigration, but the customs house, where the customs officers were the ones in charge right up to after World War, after World War II. So yes, it's a complicated situation, but uh, and mostly people couldn't bring in um, children. Uh, very often they had children who were born in Australia and they raised them in China and then brought them back again. They did have the right to return in theory, although again, in practice, there were some difficulties there. But by and large, if people had Australian birth, they were able to come in. But it wasn't like America where you could pass on your citizenship through through birth. It didn't work that way. You had to be born in Australia to have any rights. Mm. Uh, but children born in Australia in China had no, no specific rights at all. Uh, by the way, pragmatically, there was some leniency involved, but it was discretionary mm. rather than legal. Next a question from Michelle, and um, she's asking, is that true that the real estate agency LG Hooker was started by a Chinese person? Yes, supposedly that's, that's true, true. Yeah, LG Hooker was, uh, was Chinese, or part Chinese, and he, he, he chose to hide it for many years, and then it came out uh, many, uh, years later. Um, the hooker, supposedly the story is, comes from his the position he played in football, he was a hooker, but... Um, I don't know the full story, but I have heard the various variations of that of that story, and see, it seems to be that that that, that particular story is certainly true. But I don't know all the details. Yeah. Um, next, a question, Juanita. Um, she's asking, "Hi, Michael. I feel Ch a Chinese as a market gardeners uh, are not necessarily a stereotype. Occupations dependent on." geographical locations and time, etc. For example, in cities, you found a greater range of occupations, uh, such as the cabinet makers. Or in 1870s to 80s, you found land clear, clear, clearers, limbathers, for example, uh, market gardeners was a dominant occupation because rail allowed access to Sydney market. So it sort of depends. It does depend, and uh, that's the point I was trying to make, I think. This period is a period of much broader things. This idea of the market gardeners is something that actually happens over time. So by the 1920s, uh, as you're referring to Bathurst and so forth and the, and the connections to Sydney, yes, you could say around Bathurst, there was almost all the Chinese were simply market gardeners because it had been reduced by that stage. But in the period I'm talking about, the, uh, the 18, late 1880s, around the turn of the century, it's much broader uh, uh, range of occupations. But we think of it in terms of only market gardeners because we're taking that period later on where market gardening becomes to dominate more and more and, and transplanting it back into a previous generation. So at this period, I wanted to emphasize that market gardening is a stereotype because later on that stereotype does in a sense become true or truer because the range of occupations does reduce. Um, and again, going back to the question about certificates of exemption, um, people were allowed to come in, but they were allowed to come in if they were substitute from market garden, the department actually encouraged um, the replacement of workers on market gardens, but they didn't do that, for example, for carpenters or for other positions because they saw them as competitive with white workers, whereas market gardening was seen as a Chinese job. So within the, within the uh, officialdom, market gardening was seen as Chinese and therefore they gave it more leniency and allowed more people to come in if they were gonna work on a market garden. 
Um, and there are other reasons as well. So, so yes, it's true, but I mean, it's true over time. And, and what I'm trying to, to emphasize is that it wasn't true for every period uh, in this particular period, the range of occupations, even in Bathurst, you know, corn growing and other, other, other things were, were much broader than simply market gardening. But market gardening was always important, as I said, even this period at 1.40%, which is quite a large part of your um, uh, workforce working in one particular area. Uh, so it's certainly always significant, but not as overwhelming and significant as it became or, 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 as, it, or as it is in people's um, thinking. Yeah. That, was, that was how I was trying to, to, um, to get that across. Mm. I, I actually have a question in relation to that, uh, uh, relation to occupations from the list that you listed. You know, it uh, seems like either they depend on uh, stereotype or it depends on the circumstances. So what I, what I see is like, are those occupations are culture specific? You know, so uh, for example, I don't see pub in there. So, yes, um, yeah. I don't know if they're cultural specific. I think they're specific broadly to, um, uh, to people's aims and ideals. So if you're thinking it's still in terms of that your family is in, is in China and that's where your home is, that's where you ultimately want to retire to or where you want to go back to and establish then what you're looking for is occupations that you can kind of go in and out of. So market gardening is perfect for this. You don't own the land. You, there's no need to own the garden. You just lease the land. You work on it uh, within a partnership, maybe with five or 10 other people. And if you want to go to China for a couple of years, then you simply sell your share and go, you go. And then you can go back to China, stay for a couple of years, and then you can come back again and buy another share and start working in market gardening again. And many of these businesses uh, or the, and these occupations are like that. They're flexible. Uh, they're good earning, they're, you know, you, you work hard, but you, you don't have to kind of tie yourself down. If you're a shopkeeper and you own the business and, you, and you're established in the town, then that means you probably already decided that you're going to stay, that your place to live is going to be Australia. So you've got choices that people are making. And, and in, in general, a lot of these um, occupations, I think, are more about where people think of their, of their home is, even if they've been living in Australia for many, many years. They're, psychologically, they're thinking their home is still in, in the village. Uh, even people who never never end up going back often think in those terms. They send money back. Uh, they 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 are involved in the marriages of their cousins and their uh, nieces and nephews and so forth, and they send money for that. So uh, you know, so they kind of psychologically still thinking in those terms, and they and this perhaps determines some of the occupations that people are involved in. But there's also this racism, and there's also this sense of you know what what do you can deal with? I mean, you're dealing with a wider um, uh, mainstream society that makes it harder. I mean, people could run pubs. I mean, there certainly were people who did, did run these kinds of things, but they were individual ones and certainly wasn't a wide ranging occupation. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yes, so it depends on how you did. But some people could do it. I mean, not everybody uh, um, um, can, can run a pub. You have to have a certain kind of personality and that involves certainly being able to deal with, with all your customers without too much trouble. And pubs were very rough places in the 19th century. They weren't quite <laughs> the same as they are uh, today. Mm. Uh, I have a couple of a quick questions. Uh, one is on um, uh, at the very beginning, you know, like there were a lot of uh, Chinese laborers as well as Indians. Uh, it didn't seem like uh, Indians copped to so much of discrimination. Is that because of sheer numbers? Um, by and large, I think the, just the numbers. I mean, the, the um, Australian politicians who were talking about federation feared India as much as they did China in terms of numbers. I could look at the map and, and knew there were a lot of Indians and they knew these were British subjects and the British were kind of pressuring them to treat them well. But, but the numbers in Australia were very, very tiny. Uh, but even those small numbers caused a bit of a stir. I mean, towards the end of the 19th century, there were small numbers of Indian people, small numbers of Japanese people coming into Australia, very tiny in comparison just to the Chinese numbers and the Chinese numbers weren't all that fantastically high. But that was enough for them to begin to, to want to bring in legislation to start barring people. They didn't want things to be the thin end of the wedge. You know, they always saw it in terms of, you know, you let a few in and there's gonna be a lot more following along. But it wasn't a lot of um, specific racism again. And again, I think mainly because of numbers, but also of course, I think uh, we remember that India was part of the empire. And so many Australians were a bit more familiar with India in the 19th century than we realize. Uh, we think that again, because of the whitewashing that Australia had nothing to do with, with Asia, nothing to do with other parts of the world. But in fact, it was, had been long connected with India for many years as part of the empire. Many officials right through the 19th century had worked in India. Many white settlers in Australia had previously lived in India. So they were quite familiar uh, 
with India and Indians and didn't fear them or didn't see them as a kind of a, a hostile alien race. In fact, they were, they were they probably thought they knew more about India than they did about Chinese uh, in, in, in general. They probably didn't know, didn't know as much as they thought they knew, but they, since it was all part of a, one big happy imperial family, uh, the hostility to Indians wasn't that, that great. In fact, the greatest fear for Indians was they were often hawkers going around the countryside. And the idea was, you know, we're not too sure who the father of that child is. You know, they, they were a bit more worried about it. Who, what they were getting up to as they went around to the farms and knocked on the doors of, of farmers' wives. Uh, so that was the kind of main concern with the Indians at one point period of time anyway in, in the mm. 19th century. So yeah. I suppose... No, no, no fear, large hostility, sorry. Right, no. right. So the fear primarily coming from like not knowing, not understanding. Like yeah, not, it's just a general um, kind of racism that they had mm. and they were not ignorance of people, but not, not a widespread fear at that um, point anyway. Yeah, I have another question is uh, now it's a lot of it seems to me a lot, lot of a focus on other occupations that then rather than just the stereotyped ones, you know, like an opera and a culture elements, uh, other things that, that Chinese migrants have have done uh, kind of a recently. Is it, do you see why is that the case? Why the focus on the other? Yeah, the, the threat. It was more recent than before. And what, what's the driver behind this a focus or shift of a focus? Uh, well, I think people are beginning to realise that, well, I think it's this, this uh, shift in perspective. And so previous history has always been looked at, uh, looked at Chinese Australian history from a white perspective. And so it's always been about racism. And so whether you're uh, defending the racism or attacking the racism, you're still saying that the main drivers of this history are, are white people. Uh, and the Chinese are simply victims in some way. But when you start shifting the perspective to a, from a Chinese perspective and say, what are the people whose history this is? What are they thinking? What are they doing? Well, then of course you begin to realize that they're thinking and doing different things. They're not spending their life being victims. They're not spending a life worrying about racism. They're spending a life doing a whole lot of things. And yes, racism and, and, and being discriminated against is part of that within the Australian context. But they're doing other things. They're traveling, they're working. And then you begin to, when you begin to look at what people are doing, I mean, you look at someone's life history or you look at their list of occupations. If you look at these, say, the certificates of exemption from the mutation test, the file asks people to list all their occupations uh, up till 1901 or up to when they made the application. Well, they're not just writing in market garden all the time. They're writing down a whole lot of different things. And they're usually traveling around a lot. They usually say, I live two years here and I live five years here. They're quite itinerant very often, but doing different things. And so you soon get to realize, if you, if you look carefully at people's individual lives, um, uh, they're doing a, a, a wide variety, uh, a wide variety of things, um, and so yes, I think it's just a shift in perspective that says you know we, we're not talking about uh, history just purely from a, a white perspective. We're talking about the history from the perspective of the people who's living that history, and that brings in other other dimensions as soon as as soon as you do that. You going back to the village and, and and wandering around the village and asking people what was going on. You know, how did so-and-so make his money? How did your grandfather make his money? Well, he did this and he did that. You know, you soon t get told what they were doing. Um, and and it, it isn't, the answer isn't always, oh, he was a market gardener. Sometimes it is, but very often, no, uh, he, was, uh, he was a doctor. Uh, or he, was a, he was a merchant. He, he, he was a buyer. He ran a department store in Hong Kong and then he came to Australia simply to buy wool. I mean, he was a you know, very different kind of um, a person then 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 uh, then the, the stereotype would have us believe one last question how did uh, dictation test the work work very well in deterring or restricting Chinese coming uh, yes I think so it was a very effective test I mean it, particularly when you compare it to the loopholes that the Americans had with their so-called exclusion act it was very effective because it was mainly dealt with by the shipping companies of course I mean uh, you, you there are untold numbers of people who simply never got on a boat um, because they weren't allowed to. They weren't allowed to buy a ticket. Uh, the shipping companies very quickly realized that because they had to take them back. You see, the shipping companies couldn't risk, didn't want to risk bringing someone all the way to Sydney or Melbourne, have them get given the dictation test because they were fined a hundred pounds, the shipping company, and they then had to take that person back uh, and usually didn't get any fee for that. So they were very careful to make sure nobody got on a boat unless they thought there was some possibility they would actually be allowed to go into Australia. Even despite that, they didn't do, of course, did end up having to take many people back and were often fined 100 pounds uh, into the bargain. So it was it was a very effective one for controlling things big in those days. Of course, ships were the only way, so the ships were were it. Um, if people wanted to get around the dictation test, they did so mainly through smuggling and through substitutions by, by um, having false documents and so forth, which uh, again, uh, the shipping companies weren't held responsible 
for that, well, they were for some smuggling or desertions, which was another way, which is where someone was a member of the ship's crew. And then they deserted the ship uh, in the terminology of the time, they jumped off the ship and stayed in Australia. The, the shipping company was responsible for that. So again, they were careful to try and manage that as much as they could. But by and large, despite these these um, uh, ways of evading it, uh, I think the acidification test was very successful uh, from, from a wide Australia's point of view. And certainly reduced the numbers very greatly um, uh, as we'll see in the next, uh, next lecture, how the, how, how the community shrank quite a lot in the 1920s uh, into the early 30s before it began to grow again uh, for various change, things changed in the international scene. Mm. So languages play a big role. <laughs> yes, oh yeah, very much. Interesting. I think that's all we have. I mean, the, the last two are not really questions, and so they're answering to other people's questions. So thank you so much, Michael, for the, another very interesting session, and thanks to all the audience for your you know, very active uh, contribution and uh, participation. So we really look forward to the next one. And thank you all. And this uh, session will uh, has been recorded and it will be again posted on our website along with uh, the previous uh, three now. So yeah, you're more than welcome to get on the website to watch it again or trans or refer it forward to other people. Thank you. Thank you very much and uh, have a good night. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, yeah, thank everyone. You. See you later. Bye-bye.